So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar titled Collaboration Lab Number One, Moving Down the Pyramid, a Title V Perspective. My name is Becky Goins, and I am the Programs Associate on the Health Systems Transformation Team at AMCHIP. On our agenda today, we will start with welcome and housekeeping. Paige Businich, the Senior Program Manager for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs at AMCHIP, will be making opening remarks. She will then introduce the speakers and turn it over to their presentation. There will be time for a Q&A. We'll also have a activity for all of the participants at the end. And lastly, we'll wrap up this webinar with a short survey for you to complete, which will open up on your browser. So this is the agenda. And before we begin our presentations, I do have a few housekeeping reminders. So press star six to mute or unmute your line. Please mute, mute your phone lines now and adjust the volume on your computers. If you're having any technical difficulties with your audio, just use the chat feature on the right side of the screen and I will be able to help you. If you need to step away from the phone, please do not put the call on hold or we will hear your hold music. Just hang up and join again. Submit questions or comments in the chat box in the lower right hand side of your screen. And as mentioned, today's call is recorded, and the recording and slides will be available on the AMCHIP website within a few weeks after this broadcast. And finally, as I mentioned, you will receive a short evaluation survey after this webinar is complete. It will pop up automatically on your browser. Please take a few moments to provide some feedback, as your input is really important to us and very helpful in planning future events and learning opportunities for you all. I would, I would now like to turn it over to Paige to finish the Senior Program Manager for the welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Becky. Hi, everybody. Um, we at AMCHIP are very excited about today's national webinar, which is part of AMCHIP's ongoing work to equip MCH programs and partners with effective strategies and proven practices for collaborating. Today's conversation is part one of a three-part series that will explore these strategies. We hope you will find this series useful as the ideas and concepts presented come straight from the practices of our guest speakers. Some of you may happen to recall conversations that occurred at the October Federal State Partnership and Technical Assistance Meeting to be of similar content to today's presentation. However, this webinar series is just meant to be a concurrent conversation. Webinar two will focus on partnering with families, communities, and local health departments, while the final webinar in the series will emphasize the workforce perspective. So now the objectives for today's webinar are to increase knowledge of the evolution of recommendations regarding the provision of direct services by public health agencies with special emphasis on the impacts and options for Title V MPH programs. To identify state Title V children and youth with special health care needs program strategies to move down the population health pyramid and to equip participants with examples of effective population-based services and collaborations. The three MCH leadership competencies that will be addressed on today's webinar are critical thinking, interdisciplinary and interprofessional team building, and family professional partnerships. Now, as you can see on the slide, here are our four speakers for today. Um, in the file pod, you can also find full bios for all four of our um, speakers who have been so generous with their time. Um, as we go through uh, the list of speakers today, I will just give a short introduction to these individuals, and you can read more about all of the great work that they're doing um, in their bios that are in the file pod. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Brett Ewey, um, who 
with, is um, representing the Alpine Health Strategies. Um, and Brent is the principal there um, over in Geneva, Switzerland. So I'm not even sure what time it is right now for him, but he's here um, and ready to talk. Um, looks like we have the slide cutting off, so can we maybe try to fix that? If we can, great. If not, we will <coughs> roll with it as, as we can. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> to answer the question, it's 8.05 in uh, Geneva time, so it's wonderful uh, to say good evening to um, any neighbors here, but more likely good afternoon and good morning to those of you um, out on the West Coast. Uh, real pleasure to be here today. Um, as many of you know, I spent about eight years of my career at AMCHIP as the uh, Director of Policy and Government Affairs up until a little over a year ago when we made this move to Geneva where my wife is now um, representing the U.S. government at the World Trade Organization and gave me the opportunity to launch an independent consulting firm, Alpine Health Strategies, as you see there. Um, and so that's kind of the, the quick update on me. And let's just jump right into this, um, talk a little bit about setting the stage for the great presentation to come and some of the dialogue we have planned, some great discussion questions. Um, quick overview of what I've been asked to cover, really looking at um, uh, an overview of the, the pyramid, uh, the MCH pyramid of services, where did it come from, how has it evolved, um, concurrent with that, what has been the evolution of recommendations um, from various bodies on public health agencies' roles in delivering clinical health services, how does that mesh or not mesh with uh, the Title V statute, so we'll try to make it as, um, as relevant as possible. And then, as I said, we'll begin some dialogue on current and future challenges. Um, but real quick, first of all, Paige did a, a great job of talking about the, the formal um, competencies that we're going to cover today. I wanted to, to quick introduce with an informal competency that we hope to get you with today, and that's uh, situational humor. So many of you know that I'm, in addition to being an MCH professional, I'm a father of two young girls, which gives me license to tell many dad jokes. So here's uh, the first for the presentation today. What did one pyramid say to the other pyramid? How's your mummy? Yes, I can't hear the laughter, but I'm sure it's rolling a across the country uh, as we speak. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the, for the feedback. Um, so let's jump in on uh, a more serious note. The question, who came up with the pyramid of MCH services? Um, of course, it was the ancient Egyptians. No, it wasn't. It was the uh, leadership of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau in uh, circa uh, mid-1990s. The original Pyramid of Health Services um, made its appearance in the, the formal HRSA block grant guidance. Um, and this was an era uh, in the, where I, I need to speculate a little bit. I, I tried to research more formally um, the, the emergence of the pyramid, and, and there wasn't much I could find um, beyond some, some references, some short references. But, but my recollection, and I had just started working in, in Washington, D.C. at the time, um, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau had just brought on a gentleman by the name of Dr. Peter Van Dyke, who had been the MCH director in Utah. He came on to run the um, state, uh, state Community Health Bureau, of, or the State Bureau of Maternal and Child Health Bureau, right about the time of the Clinton health reform discussion when the nation thought it was on the cusp of potentially expanding health insurance to nearly all Americans. And so the pyramid, I think, not coincidentally emerged not too long after that. As you can see, with the purpose of displaying the uniqueness of the MCH block grant as the only federal pub program that consistently provides services at all levels of the pyramid. And that was really the background on, on the pyramid. It was to give a, a visual representation of the, the vast range of services that MCH agencies and their partners support um, with, of course, direct services at the top enabling services. And then here's what may be a little different if you only know the revised pyramid. Um, the original pyramid had, had four levels with population-based services right above infrastructure building services. What, um, what the, the way it was presented often was that uh, the, the MCH block grant was unique in that Medicaid would perhaps be um, focusing mostly at the top of the pyramid, direct health services. A program like community health centers certainly doing direct services and some enabling services. Um, so it would maybe reach the, the, those two um, other programs much more specific, whether it was just immunizations or just family planning nutrition would, would fall in there but not encompass the entire pyramid, obviously. But Title V was the program that was deliberately designed to um, 
to uh, put together uh, services at all, all levels of the pyramid. And uh, so today where you can find the MCH pyramid formally is in the MCH block grant guidance posted by HRSA on an annual basis. And what we have um, is, is a, referred to as a transformation of the MCH block grant that occurred, um, started in 2014 and reflected in today's block grant guidance where you see essentially a, a smushing together of the, the, the bottom two um, uh, lines of the pyramid as uh, public health services and systems. And again, I'm speculating a little bit. What we know was that we'd always had trouble selling the infra infrastructure part of, of the MCH block grant. We all know how critical and, and foundational that is. We know that that's um, what, what many MCH leaders appreciate so much about the MCH block grant, that it allows that flexibility to pay for infrastructure. What we found was that that was often a hard sell with policymakers that, that didn't want to pay for infrastructure. They, they got direct services intuitively. They understood the importance of enabling services, um, but, but they were really tuning out on, on infrastructure. It sounded too much like administration. And so I think that there was some thinking about the renaming and then linking it to the MCH essential services did a better job of, of talking about infrastructure without using that word and, and, and potentially losing um, supporters. So that was some of the, the thinking, as I recall it, during the transformation. Other thing to note on the transformation was it was occurring after the passage of the Affordable Care Act when the thought was more and more people would be receiving coverage for the top part of the pyramid with direct services. And, um, and so we always knew that there would be gaps, but the idea at that time being that the Affordable Care Act at full implementation would really relieve some of the pressure on states and communities to be focusing on the top of the pyramid at direct services. And I think that's the, the interesting crossroads that we're at today is seeing how the, um, that law has been implemented, where we're at in insurance coverage, where those remaining gaps are, really drives, I think, a lot of that dialogue at the state and community level about where on the pyramid you want to be. Um, quick overview on some of the other parts of, of the thinking around the pyramid was that it would drive some of the reporting. And you're all familiar with the Title V information system. Um, so know that when you report on an annual basis in your block grant applications, the Bureau can take that information, um, display it graphically, and that, as you all know, one of the things that they track is where are the expenditures made by pyramid service level. So the first slide here is the, the total Title V expenditures. So you're looking at it's a little small to read, but the, the total $5.9 billion in MCH partnership funds. So that includes, obviously, the 600 and some million federal appropriation, but also the, um, the state matching funds, local funds, um, any program revenue, whether that's coming through from Medicaid or other programs. So this is the grand total. And what you see there is that by far the largest area is direct services, over half a dollar of the total, total partnership budget going to direct services, um, enabling services being the, the second most, and then the bottom of the pyramid that public health services and systems um, taking up at, at the full expenditures, the, the smallest level. We also can get, though, however, a comparison of where the federal dollars versus state expenditures are. And so if you look on the left of this slide, that's the $539 million of the state allocation, the federal appropriation that goes to states. And there you see, actually, it's just a small amount that's going from the federal fund into direct services, um, and then about an even split between enabling and the, the bottom of the pyramid with public health systems. But here is kind of the takeaway when you look at the non-federal dollars, so those include state match and program revenues, there you again see the big majority going to direct services. Um, and so I think that the takeaway message there is that, that state funds are often used um, primarily for the direct services, whereas with the federal funds there, there's a different allocation. And, um, and we'll hear from, uh, from three of terrific uh, children with special needs directors shortly that can kind of, I think, expand upon some of the thinking about how they make those decisions that drive those expenditures. Um, finally, we can look by population and where the expenditures um, are, which populations they're serving. And perhaps not as a surprise here, you'll see the, the green is children with special health care needs is where the vast majority of direct service funding is going, um, very small amounts for both pregnant women, moms and infants, and, and children. Um, and so I think, again, that shows why we're focusing today on a dialogue with those children with special health care needs directors as reflecting of where the, the vast majority of that direct service investment is. 
Quick um, baseline, and then some of this is dated. This is um, information from the National Association of County and City Health Officials, um, but just wanted to share a little bit on what we know. Uh, it's a little bit of an incomplete picture, but the, the level of direct service provision at local health departments, so governmental, local public health agencies. Um, the first slide actually starts with, with focus on MCH services, so you see um, more than half of them delivering WIC, more than half doing MCH services. And then with family planning and EPSDT, you have more of a clinical component there. But then the further down, a uh, smaller amount that are doing well-child visits, even smaller on prenatal care and, and the, the smallest of obstetrical care. The next slide expands it out a little more where we see, um, again, more of the direct services. I think the takeaway message here, comprehensive primary care, only 13% of, of governmental local public health agencies saying that that's a, um, a, a service that they're offering. You can see it broken down by, by um, the, the population they're serving. So the, the larger health departments, those are large, probably larger cities and counties, that um, still only 22%, so still less than one in four doing comprehensive primary care. And again, this data is, is a bit dated. It's 2010, but I think you could see there had already been a shift, um, a substantial shift, I think, from this data away from direct uh, medical services in local health department um, settings. And again, I think some of our, our presenters that follow me will fill in a little bit about how some of that evolution out of local health departments providing the services to other contractors that perhaps are better equipped um, to do that. But that's a, a picture that's of where um, local health department service provision was. So let's shift gears a little bit um, more and talk about this idea of working down the pyramid. Where does this come from? Who's been pushing it? What's the, the, um, the kind of expert and, uh, recommendations behind it? And to, to begin that discussion, we go back three decades to uh, the Institute of Medicine's famous Future of Public Health report. Um, I know when I was in public health school, this was assigned reading. When, uh, when I started hiring people, it's often um, one of the first things we gave them on one of their first days is kind of a uh, required reading to get their, their grounding in public health practice. Now, obviously, um, three, three decades on is getting a little bit dated. Uh, I know we always refer to it as the salmon report. It was that, that pinkish salmon color. Um, but there in that report, you find some of the first official um, policy recommendations regarding this issue. They never, of course, talk about it in terms of the pyramid, but the, the issue of providing direct services. And so the very first kind of key finding one of, that they present is um, about public health agencies having become the providers of last resort for personal medical care. And then here's the, the, the value statement they attach to that, draining vital resources away from population-wide services. So clearly they're, they're showing, tipping their hand there, that um, creating the, this issue of, of a diversion of resources that need to do safety net services in public health settings, diverting resources from other, other types of services. So a little more uh, specific on their recommendations. Um, they first talked about the, the responsibility. Again, remember this is 1988. We're six years or about four years before the Clinton health reform effort. There had been other um, universal coverage proposals that had never really gained much ground in Congress at that time. So um, clearly an era with a number of uninsured and, and rapidly rising numbers of uninsured at that time. But coming out clear stating that there, there's a, a need for the federal government to figure out that question. And then, and then some acknowledgement of that reality, the second, the second recommendation saying until that, recommend, until that federal action is forthcoming, pu public health agencies must continue to serve with quality and respect to the best of their ability, the priority personal health needs of the un uninsured, underinsured, and Medicaid clients. So that recognition that, um, that without other providers available in the communities, at least some public health agencies would need to continue to fulfill those dual roles. Again, this is back in 1988. So fast forward a few years, you have the Clinton health reform effort in the early 90s. And here you have a number of, at that time, CDC leaders weighing in um, to that debate on expanding health insurance and the future of governmental public health. And the, the first one, it was a, a group article that appeared in JAMA in 1994 um, at the time of the Clinton health reform debate. And as you can see, what they essentially said was, um, regardless of what happens with health reform, um, unless we look at public health at the same time, um, and there, that there would be uh, essentially the end of the quote, that having access to quality medical care will do little to influence the true determinants of ill health, unsafe environments, unhealthy personal behaviors, 
and biological, genetic, and socioeconomic factors. So this is a group from CDC saying, um, essentially making the argument that, that health care, health insurance is not the most important thing to people's health. Um, and so kind of putting it out there pretty stark, um, that, that assuring that will have little do little to influence the true determinants of ill health. At the same time, and I think um, Dr. Satcher was one of the, the authors on that piece, he was making a number of speeches at that time. Um, I didn't have a, a specific date from this, um, but, but a number of speeches where, where his presentation was not for a pyramid of health services, but perhaps maybe a, a square with four quadrants. He kept talking about the need to strengthen support for a balanced community health system that includes health promotion, disease prevention, early detection, and universal access to care. So rather than the sort of either or that his colleagues were pro proposing up here, um, I, I always like Dr. Satcher's view of that idea that you could have a, a balanced health system. Um, hard to balance, I guess, a pyramid, but again, a, a square would probably work well there. So that, again, is around 1994. Then let's jump forward. You got 2012. Now you're two years past the passage of the Obamacare Affordable Care Act. Institute of Medicine convenes another group to look at the future of public health, um, issues a report. And what they make a statement at that time is that you now have uh, coverage available to a broader cross-section of the population. So not universal coverage, but a broader coverage. So it raises a question. And here you see, I think, a little more sophistication in there. They're hedging their language a little more. The, the role of some public health departments as clinical providers. Their responsibility, they acknowledge, has a complex history. Their advantages, disadvantages to the role of public health in the direct provision of care. But here it comes their, their kind of final value judgment is that in large measure, however, public health agencies must be freed to focus more intensely on delivery of population-based health services. So again, not saying move down the pyramid in, in MCH terms, but clearly that's the intent of their recommendation um, to move from clinical care to population-based health services. Again, this is Institute of Medicine, um, a large committee of public health leaders from across the, the nation on that. Two specific recommendations of note for us in there, um, they're recommending that as clinical care, clinical care provision in a community is no longer requiring financing by public health agencies, those should work to develop adequate alternative capacity in a community's clinical delivery system. And many of you know the Affordable Care Act um, vastly expanded the dollars that were available for community health centers, so I think that was a lot of the feeling at the time, that the new capacity would come um, with federal support, not through public health agencies, but through those community health centers. And then recommendation nine um, was essentially saying that any money that gets freed up as more people gain coverage should be um, not uh, not put into savings, not, not reallocated for further coverage expansions, but reallocated by those state and local governments to population-based prevention and health promotion activities conducted by the public health department. I think in you know, there was a, a nice theory that money would be freed up that could be used for population-based coverage, I think, um, or population-based services. I think the reality has been tougher to find those savings. And as you all know, shifting money from one funding stream to another, um, rather difficult. But I'd be interested in some of our speakers' perspective on that. Um, wrapping up quickly here to get to some of those speakers, some, some of the things that were in that report were some caveats that to definitely recognize that at full implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there would still be an estimated 30 million uninsured. When I just checked in preparing slides, I think we we're down to 29 million. So it, in some ways exceeded that expectation. Um, and then, of course, approximately 6 million of those, and that's a, a, a rough estimate, be undocumented, raising a whole um, slew of questions of, of how, um, how they can be served. And then uh, the IOM also noted that circumstances may make it more appropriate for public health agencies in some jurisdictions to provide specific kinds of clinical services directly. So again, I think some growth in not making it an either or, but a both and, and recognizing that some communities are going to only have capacity through their public health agencies. And then this last caveat is obviously there's been um, a lot of instability in the uh, thinking and the implementation around the Affordable Care Act, the political football it's been over the last few years. Um, so that's certainly been um, part of the mix of what we've been dealing with. And then last from the IOM, talking about um, that opportunity as a public health agency's transition out of clinical care to apply their skills in population health to new partnerships with healthcare. And I think we're on the cusp of that. Um, I think there's sometimes downsides of that, um, but I think uh, that was where they were thinking is that it opened up doors for new um, for new partnerships. Finally, uh, one uh, more recent, the most recent um, kind of issue or uh, recommendation of moving down 
the, the Pyramid of Health Services. This was from CDC Director Tom Frieden, an article published in the American Journal of Public Health, um, where he took the concept of the MCH pyramid but put it broader into uh, just a, a pyramid of health impact. And his takeaway message was that interventions focusing on the lower level of the pyramid tend to be more effective because they reach broader segments of society, less require less individual effort, and that implementing interventions at each of the levels can achieve the maximum possible sustained public health benefit. So again, not using the, the terms of moving down the pyramid um, in, in stark MCH terms, but really making that case that uh, the largest impact they have is at the bottom of the pyramid. So closing out, um, a couple of questions I've just put up there to help uh, as we go to dialogue. Um, and that's just to get some discussion going. I'm sure you have other questions, so I won't read through those, but have you chance, take a chance to look at those. And turn back to Paige to see if we want to pause now for some questions or jump to the next speaker. We can come back however you prefer to proceed. Great. Thanks so much, Brent. That was a great presentation. Um, so Brent has put together a few discussion questions. I also just put out a call for any questions that you may have for Brent's presentation. Um, we, have a, we had blocked off a few minutes um, for just a dedicated question and answer uh, for anything that Brent may have covered um, to clear up any questions you may have before we jump into our um, three subsequent presenters. Um, so I'll just give you all about 30 seconds or so. Feel free to unmute your line by pressing star six and asking your question or you can just go ahead and type it into the chat box. Or if you'd like to add to one of the questions on the screen, you are welcome to do that as well. And while those questions are formulating, I will have a question for you all, which is, does anyone know what the most common health professional is in Egypt, which of course is the land of the pyramids? That would be a chiropractor. chiropractor. I warned you. I warned you there'd be dad jokes. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate the feedback. <laughs> yes, feel free to use any any dad jokes or in the public domain. All right. Well, I take it um, that uh, the dad joke just totally killed the vibe and no one wants to ask any questions. Uh, but um, I think that some of these questions might come back after we um, hear from our other speakers who will give, um, you know, their specific um, perspectives from um, the states that they are working in. So, Great. I will definitely hang around and, and be here for discussion later. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, Brent. All right, so now we will turn it over um, to our first speaker, uh, Mr. Lonnie Barnett. Um, so Lonnie is the Director of Children's Special Health Care Services Division at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, um, where he's been in that role since 2011. Um, so Lonnie, if you want to go ahead and unmute your line, and we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, and, and good day, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Lonnie Barnett, and as uh, was shared a moment ago, I am uh, the Division Director for the Children's Special Health Care Services Division here at the Department of Health and Human Services in Michigan. Uh, I've been in this role since 2011 and have worked for the State Health Department since 1998, so just over 20 years. And so what I will go over very quickly is a quick overview of Children's Special Health Care Services in Michigan and then spend a few minutes talking about how we've been moving down the pyramid or describing at what levels within the pyramid we've been operating uh, throughout the last few years. And so, uh, as you can see on this slide, Children's Special Health Care Services is a program within the Department of Health and Human Services with a focus on finding, diagnosing, and treating children in Michigan who have a chronic illness or disabling condition. Uh, our program is, has its enabling legislation in our public health code. Uh, we were previously called the Crippled Children's Program. Uh, that name changed a number of years ago 
the program itself has a history that goes back to the late 1800s to the 1880s. Uh, and we've always had a focus on what today would be described as medical conditions. Uh, I'll note that in 2015, uh, the language in our enabling legislation was updated to remove references to crippled children uh, and replace with terminology such as children and youth with special health care needs. Uh, that change didn't reflect a change in scope of the program, but was really focused on a removal of language that was considered antiquated and in some instances potentially offensive. So eligibility for our program, again, we focus primarily on children less than 21 years of age with a couple of exceptions. Uh, one must have a qualifying condition, one of 2,700 uh, medical diagnoses, uh, ICD-10 code diagnoses. Uh, income is not a factor in determining eligibility. And I highlighted uh, this statement. Uh, again, we one can be eligible for our program simply based or solely based on the qualifying condition and meeting medical severity criteria. Uh, there is, however, a payment agreement. There's To enroll in the program, one needs to pay to enroll. Uh, that payment agreement is waived if you're enrolled in Medicaid or uh, the state, uh, the SCHIP program in Michigan that's referred to as My Child. Uh, but there is a, a fee to join the program. And one can have other insurance and be enrolled in Children's Special Health Care Services. About two-thirds are duly enrolled in Medicaid or SCHIP. Uh, but the other third are not, and of that third that are not enrolled in Medicaid or SCHIP, about 85% have uh, other insurance coverage, uh, private coverage. Uh, I'll point out that Title V funding is only used for the population that's not enrolled in Medicaid or SCHIP. Uh, we don't use Title V funding to support medical care and treatment for the Medicaid population. And in terms of the size of the program financially for the Title V, what we call the Title V only enrollees, uh, it's about a $40 million program in terms of our annual expenditures, and less than 20% of that is funded with Title V funds. And so that's uh, is consistent with the information Brent shared earlier. Uh, and just quickly, I won't read the diagnoses on these slides. You can see them for yourself. But again, eligible diagnoses, here's just a, some of the examples. Again, very clinical, medically focused. And then we're often asked about uh, behavioral health conditions, and we don't cover, excuse me, we don't cover conditions that are considered developmental disabilities or behavioral health diagnoses, autism, and things of that sort. So thinking about the, the timeline that Brent shared with us a, a few moments ago, uh, this slide uh, focuses on uh, healthcare marketplace changes that we anticipated would impact CSHS enrollment in Michigan, starting with the Affordable Care Act which was signed, as you know, in March of 2010. Uh, there, were, there was language in the Affordable Care Act that pre-existing condition exclusions were uh, to no longer be in place by six months after enactment, which was September of 2010. Uh, the annual and lifetime cap uh, impact of the Affordable Care Act went into effect in 2011. Uh, also in Michigan, in November 2010, we put in place a requirement that, that low-income CSHS enrollees would be required to apply for Medicaid or SCHIP as a condition for CSHS coverage. Uh, our interest was in having folks who are eligible for Medicaid participate in Medicaid in order to preserve Title V and uh, state dollars. And then also in October of 2012 was when uh, the CSHS population in Michigan that was duly enrolled in Medicaid began a transition that took six months to complete, but we began enrolling these individuals into Medicaid health plans, and we anticipated that would impact our enrollment as well. And so when we look at this slide, at the top you'll see is the enrollment for FY 2012, which was an annual enrollment October of 2011 through September of 2012. Uh, we had the non-Medicaid population enrolled in CSHCS was uh, 10,549 individuals. Uh, if you look further down the slide, also in red font is the annual enrollment for FY17, uh, 10,829 individuals. In essence, our enrollment has stayed the same in spite of the, the marketplace changes that I described in the slide earlier. Uh, we had anticipated enrollment would drop, but we really did not see that drop. And as you can also see on this slide, there's been an increase in the, in the CSHCS Medicaid dual enrollment uh, by about 9,000 individuals. This next slide uh, is another way to uh, also review this information, although this is point-in-time enrollment, so not annual enrollment as was on the previous slide, but 
but point in time enrollment uh, looking at the first of the month from October 2010 each year through October of 2018. This data is available for each and every month, but this slide just presents on October 1st. Uh, again, you can see from October 2010 to October 2011, we did see a slight reduction in CSHCS only enrollment of about 1,000 individuals, uh, but since then it's been going up. Uh, it's now up over 11,000. In fact, the November 1st data, which isn't on this slide, uh, we surpassed 12,000 in our enrollment for CSHCS only uh, for the first time, certainly in the last eight years. So what this data shows us is that in spite of the marketplace changes, we have not seen a reduction in the demand for our services as a payer for direct care. And so as we discussed moving down the pyramid, for us, moving down the pyramid is, is in addition to our direct care services and not in lieu of. And as I mentioned before, families are, are paying to be enrolled in this program and so the benefit that we're providing uh, is exceeding the cost to enroll or else they would not choose to enroll. On this slide, you'll see the MCH pyramid again that uh, Brent showed us earlier. The only additional information on this slide is on the right side of the, of the slide where you'll see from our guidance, the Title V guidance document, I've included the definitions for direct services, enabling services, and public health services and systems. And I'll point out that for public health services and systems, this, this includes activities to carry out the core public health functions, assessment, policy development, and assurance, as well as the 10 essential MCH services. And so as we look at children's special health care services and, and the MCH pyramid, uh, we provide services at all levels of the pyramid. Uh, I've described our direct services already. We're filling gaps for families that have a child eligible for CSHCS. Our program is primarily focusing on filling that gap in private health insurance coverage. 85% uh, of our enrollees have private coverage. We also have some specialty clinics and field clinics that we support. Uh, for enabling services, we provide enabling services, care coordination, plans of care, transportation, lodging assistance. That enabling service support is focused on a population that's enrolled in CSHCS and not the broader population. And as we look at uh, public health services and systems, uh, we certainly engage in a lot of activities that would fit uh, in this part of the pyramid. We certainly inform and educate the public on available resources and services, not just for CSHCS enrolled clients, but for all children and youth with special health care needs and their families. Uh, we engage community partners through our advisory committees, grant initiatives, and we participate in other agencies' advisory committees as well. We promote and implement evidence-based practices. Uh, we have quality improvement initiatives that I'll describe uh, in a few moments, uh, learning collaboratives. We're engaged in a, a pediatric transition pilot. Uh, we certainly assess and monitor client satisfaction through our CAP survey which is a customer satisfaction survey for our clients. We also survey providers, or we will be surveying providers, assessing their satisfaction uh, with our program and their participation in the program. Uh, workforce development, uh, we've had a renewed emphasis in this area the last few years, and we've been a key partner through our Family Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs in the Michigan LEND Initiative, uh, which is uh, focused on professional education for future providers. Uh, we've always been a part of policy development through the work with our partners and through the established processes in state government. Uh, and we certainly ensure quality improvement uh, through our involvement with local public health accreditation, uh, site reviews for our children's multidisciplinary specialty clinics. Uh, a new activity for us is engagement with compliance reviews for Medicaid health plans to identify best practices and improvement opportunities for the plans and their efforts to serve CSHS clients. And so as we look at population-based services, I'll point out that uh, in some instances, the population is children who are enrolled in CSHCS, and in other instances, our focus is on the broader population. So just again, jumping quickly through the last uh, few slides, when we look at the estimated number of children and youth with health care needs in Michigan from the National Survey of Children's Health, that estimate is 448,000 plus children. Uh, we serve approximately 10% of those through our CSHCS program. Uh, I think this is consistent with what other states are seeing as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier our CSHCS uh, Family Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs. Uh, it's within that part of our office, our parent-directed center within, within CSHCS, that we are 
uh, focusing on the broader population, our family phone line uh, serves anyone who calls, our parent-to-parent -parent matching program, which is a P2P uh, program, our conference and camp scholarships are eligible for any child or parent of a child with special needs. And we recently formed a family leadership network in partnership with the uh, family to family. And so I also close, similar to Brent, uh, with other considerations. I won't read through all of these, uh, but we can talk more about these later as, as time allows. Uh, but again, moving down the pyramid for us is, a, is in, a, in addition to question for us and not in lieu of direct care services. The fourth and fifth bullet on this slide make reference to mental health services and needs for children and, and how uh, that's an area of increasing demand and we're wondering and considering how we can address that through Title V. Uh, and the last slide addresses uh, the potential for us to engage in a system capacity assessment, which is a part of our Title V uh, expectations for us. Uh, how do we work with other state government partners who are also serving children with special needs? Uh, and lastly, it would be helpful to understand HRSA's vision for Title V in light of current national discussions. And then that would set the stage for identifying and addressing TA needs uh, through HRSA, AMCHIP, and the National Center. Thank you, and I'll stop there and turn it over to our next presenter. Great. Thanks so much, Lonnie. Um, so we'll just keep going with our um, next two presenters, and then we'll have a time for large group discussion um, at the end. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Susan Chacon, who is the Director of Children's Medical Services at the New Mexico Department of Health within the Public Health Division Family Health Bureau. Uh, so Susan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paige, and good afternoon, everyone. And um, I think I'm, I, I think we're all on the same page here in terms of our theme, and I'm going to kind of follow Lonnie's lead here and talk about what's going on in New Mexico regarding moving down the pyramid. Um, so Brent gave us some history. Um, just to recap, you know, historically most of our state programs spent the majority of funding on direct services. And because of the changes in uh, financing, mostly Medicaid, SHIP, and the ACA, um, we've been able to ship some of our resources down the pyramid. And with, with HRSA, MCHB, title emphasis on systems development, and that's around medical home, transition work, family engagement, cultural competency. We've been continuing to try to address population issues. But as we all know, that health insurance does not equal access to health care. And I remember when the ACA went through and Title V was kind of under threat because there was this belief that because now everyone, most Americans would have access to health insurance, that there wasn't a need for Title V services. And we know that that's not true. That health insurance doesn't adequately address the social determinants of health, and especially for children with special health care needs programs, um, there's a lot of gaps in terms of services and um, issues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about New Mexico, what we're doing in New Mexico. So we're a typical Western state. Um, we're large in geography, small in population. We have rural and frontier areas. We have a very diverse population. Um, we're mostly Hispanic, um, but we also have 23 Native American tribes. There's 19 Pueblos, three Apache tribes, and the Navajo Nation, which is in the four corners. And we have a large Navajo <coughs> population. So our health care is very diverse as well. So we have a, most of our children are on Medicaid. Um, we also have Indian Health Services and other commercial type insurances. So our program is called Children's Medical Services. And we're, the way we're structured is we have, um, we work out of the local public health offices. And we're a social work program, so we, we focus a lot on um, care coordination. And we have staff covering, the, we have 33 counties. So our staff cover the 33 
counties, and um, this is really the focus of our work, is to reduce disparities, ensure coordinated, compassionate, culturally competent care, increase access to specialty medical care, and assure that all babies receive a, a newborn screening and follow-up through diagnosis. In, in our state, we have one children's hospital, which is located in the central part of the state. So that access to specialty care is really a driver in a lot of what we do. We also have, unfortunately, we're ranked number 50 this year. We went from 49 now to 50 in terms of um, child well-being. So most of our kids are living um, in poverty, and the, the social determinants of health and um, the quality of health care is, again, is, is a really big part of our mission um, for Children's Medical Services. And uh, we have a lot, we have many families that English is not their first language. So again, that cultural competency, that coordinated care is really the driver for our work. And as we all know, um, when you're living in poverty, your chance of having a chronic illness goes up, and so this is just kind of a snapshot of what asthma rates look like in New Mexico um, based on median income. So we are working across the pyramid, and just to kind of talk a little bit about where that lies for us, um, like Michigan, we also are a safety net payer for children that meet our eligibility and um, don't qualify for Medicaid, so we can be a payer. We also function as a secondary payer, as long as we, we do have financial guidelines and um, medical guidelines, but many times we find ourselves uh, functioning as a secondary payer for people that are on private insurance. We also work with our high-risk pool. We still have a high-risk pool in New Mexico, and children that have high-cost conditions that we are a primary payer for, we are able to enroll them onto the high-risk pool, and we pay their premiums, their co-pays, and deductibles, and um, they get a quality insurance plan, and also it helps our provider infrastructure because they're getting uh, improved reimbursement. But we're always watching what's going on with ACA. Um, we do have a, medic we're a Medicaid expansion state, luckily and that's greatly helped our coverage, especially of youth that have special health care needs. But all the volatility in the marketplace is something that really affects um, this, this category of direct care. Um, in terms of enabling services, again, that, that access to specialty care, the care coordination, um, helping families access base, basic needs, you know, food, clothing, shelter, um, we do a lot of that work, and most of our Title V funds are spent on our, um, our, our staff to support the staff in the local public health offices, and we do a lot of outreach clinics. When I started, we were doing about 120 outreach clinics, and now we're, I think we're close to 160, and the need is great. Um, we're always being asked to do more clinics, and um, that is just big part of the lack of infrastructure in our state. We're starting to explore telehealth as an option to increase access and address the need. And we are doing some population-based services. Um, we've, we've participated in learning collaboratives with AMCHIP in Nashville, and one of the pieces of work we did was working on making recommendations to our 1115 Medicaid waiver renewal, uh, especially focusing on care coordination and um, trying to get some definitions in the contracts for the, ma the managed care organizations around a shared definition for children needs and special health care needs and transition and what the best practice would, should look like when we're transitioning youth into adult care. We, we also do quality assurance work. Uh, we focus around medical home and, again, care coordination. We have a project, collaborative project with um, the ACT Early program through AMCHIP and the New Mexico Pediatric Society and the medical home that's based out of Utah to make the medical home portal a one-stop shop for all families and providers in New Mexico. 
Um, we've been working pretty closely over the past year with our Child Protective um, Services Program here around CARA and developing the Safe Plans of Care. And it's a new collaboration that we've been pretty excited about and will be rolling out statewide. Um, and we also recently had a uh, Pediatric Specialty Care Task Force that made some recommendations to our legislature around um, improving access to that specialty care with, with ideas like a, a trying to recruit more specialists through loan forgiveness programs, um, funding for the health information exchange, and trying to keep our pediatric care in, in state as much as possible because a lot of our kids have to go to our neighboring state for care. We've also increased our first defect surveillance program, and so now we're, we're reaching more families that have a newborn that's born with a, a birth defect. We're doing some more prevention and education around the prevention of birth defects. So to me, and, and I'm just struck with the conversation with Brent and Lonnie, um, when we're talking about moving down the period, pyramid, we really, I think as a state, in my state, we have to be in tune in what is our mission to the children in our state? Does it align with our work? And how can, how can we make improvements overall for all, all of our children in our state? So some of the things that come into play when we're kind of talking about those decisions are these uncertainties. Um, in New Mexico, like I said, we have a lack of health care infrastructure. In many of the communities, if, if Children's medical services isn't there, and providing these clinics and this care coordination, nobody else is going to do it. Um, and we're considered the infrastructure in many, many of these rural areas. Political will, um, like I said, we're, we're always monitoring what's going on in the health insurance world. Um, we have a new governor coming in on January. We're not sure what her mission and her goals are going to be around public health in our state. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. We're not going to be, we're not sure what direction we're going to be going there. And, and, and because of that, sometimes when you're, you know, when you're in state government, it's, there's a chain of command, and sometimes you're, you're told you need to go in one direction, and um, you, you have to do a lot of studying the issue, educating um, the authorities above you, and making recommendations. But there's still other ideas that can be pursued. And um, I think one thing that we do is really rely on our partners and our collaborative relationships, especially with Medicaid and the Medicare, managed care organizations and our family organizations. Our family organizations can provide that advocacy and um, carry your voice if you think that the needs that you assessed are still there, are not being heard by proper authorities. Um, I think taking advantage of learning opportunities, like the Action Learning Collaboratives and these type of webinars, and using those national standards as a North Star. I know I bring them to me with meetings, with Medicaid, and, and try to familiarize folks uh, with the national standards, because they are a great guide in terms of infrastructure for your state. And then I think always looking for new partners and um, agencies that are, are vested in improving ch child health in your state and sort of non-traditional partners that you may never have worked with. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Susan. All right. So we will move on quickly then to our final Presentation from Melinda Davis, who is the Director of the Children's Rehabilitation Service at the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. Um, so, Melinda? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you'll notice from the first slide that, uh, that Children's Rehabilitation Service is not located in the Department of Public Health. It's in the Department of Rehabilitation Services, and CRS has been located in that department since around 1928. And we have never been located in public health, but we have a strong relationship with our public health partners. 
we are uniquely funded to provide direct care while moving down the pyramid, and that's because we, in addition to the block grant funding, we also receive uh, state funding through state legislation. Uh, we are required to provide direct care. We also have a strong relationship with Medicaid, and we partner with them to provide medical and evaluation clinic services. I will say that we provide just as many evaluation clinics as we do medical clinics at this time because the, that is really one of the greatest needs in gap filling services in Alabama. We provide wraparound services as a part of our Medicaid agreement. We have care coordinators located in 14 community-based offices around the state to provide those services. And also, we partner with the Alabama Department of Public Health, the CHIP program. In addition to some of our clients being covered by CHIP, we have an agreement called All Kids Plus, which is a service delivery mechanism uh, that provides uh, a broader range of services than the basic benefits package. I want to share some of the some of the initiatives that we have to move down the pyramid. The family partnership is one that we have had for over 20 years. We have a very strong parent consultant program that includes the state parent consultant who's a member of our state office team. We have 11 local parent consultants and we're going to increase that number to 13 and you'll see on this slide some of the activities that they participate in, but I want to emphasize that family members are always at the table. Uh, we, we have a quarterly publication called the CRS Parent Connection that's sent out uh, to all of our offices to share with parents. We have a state parent advisory committee that meets twice a year. The local PACs meet several times a year in their own communities. And we utilize our parents to also promote legislative issues and to partner with family voices. And this slide shows some of the data that our parents have gathered uh, over the last fiscal year. There were a total of 1,923 interactions with 932 parents and professionals. And I won't go down the complete list, but you can see uh, some of the uh, services that the parents have provided over the last fiscal year. And a lot of this is information uh, by way of just talking to parents or sending them information or just connecting them to the, to, to the right community partners. We also have a youth advisory committee. And uh, the youth advisory committee has a neat name called YAT. It's for children well, not necessarily children, but youth with special health care needs for 15 to 25 years. We have two youth consultants, one located in our state office in Montgomery, and one who's located out in the local community. And our YAC uh, youth provide a youth platform. And right now, we're really working really hard to build a stronger YAC. Um, both of our, both of our Youth consultants are paid with our NCH dollars, and uh, they are they will be developing programs to ensure concerns are addressed. Uh, they communicate with other kids uh, on Facebook. They're promoting concepts uh, about access to services to transition youth to adulthood, and they're also uh, talking with each other about opportunities for them to engage in policy and procedure that we set here at CRS. You'll see here that our nine audiologists that are located in our local offices are participating in the EDI initiative. We participate in that through a partnership with public health and all newborns from hospitals are referred to CRS for follow-up screening. So we provide second-tier outpatient screening 
to this population. And if there's a need for enrollment, they're enrolled and they're monitored uh, for risk factors for progressive or delayed onset hearing loss. And we also collect and report the related data to the Alabama Department of Public Health. You'll see from this side that our EDI screening program has really grown uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, the number of screenings or second tier screenings that we have performed has increased from, uh, has increased by about 117 percent. We believe that uh, because we have a a direct service program, we're able to hire more staff. We have approximately 225 staff members, so we're able to have a greater impact on the community. So while we're providing direct services, we can also utilize many of our staff to help us to move down the pyramid. And you'll see on this slide that we have uh, an audiology program specialist who is president of the Alabama Academy of of audiology. She serves on the ADPH, or Alabama Department of Public Health, newborn hearing screening advisory committee. Uh, she's been involved with organizing a task force to revise Alabama's newborn hearing screening guidelines for audiologists, which should have a great impact on population health. She worked with our parent consultant in the Mobile office uh, to start an EDI learning community, and they have already presented on that at two conferences this past fiscal year. So I want to point out that we have been doing a lot of things in Alabama to move down the pyramid over the last several years. We've had a long partnership with the Pediatric Pulmonary Center at Children's of Alabama. Two of our staff teach sessions for trainees. We partner with Alabama State University on their MCH pipeline program. Some of our staff teach MCH history programs, uh, block grants, and advocacy. We have co-hosted with the Education Resources Inc. for SOS training. That was back in 2015, and that's a training that we're very proud of. Uh, this training um, brought attendance of about 70 people from 15 different states and five different disciplines, so we were able to uh, impact the learnings of the of the of the um, of the therapists who were a part of this program. We partnered with the University of Alabama School of Public Health Center of, for Excellence in MCH Education, Science and Practice to provide nutrition training. Uh, this occurred a few years ago, but nonetheless, it's something that we're very proud of, and the modules from this training are still available uh, on the website that you see here. We piloted telemedicine, which will have a great impact, especially for our kids in rural areas. It will also have a great impact in those areas where we don't have as many specialized positions. We established an agreement with the Alabama Department of Public Health. We negotiated reimbursement with Medicaid and Blue Cross. We piloted this telehealth clinic for pediatric neurology patients uh, with an originating site in North Alabama and a distant site in South Alabama at our CRS office. Now, I want to point out that uh, Calhoun County Health Department is a part of the Alabama Department of Public Health, and they have the necessary equipment for health, telehealth to take place in practically every county in Alabama. And our plans are to bring telemedicine to another clinic in 2019. Uh, we've also developed a charm um, electronic health record. It is not quite finished, but we started talking about this in 2016. And you can see here some of the enhancements that we've made. Uh, and we, this will provide us with improved access to data for management reports to help our state. And we're hoping that the involvement of CRS in this will become a catalyst for participation in Medicaid's One Health Record, 
We don't have a lot of physicians or hospitals who participate in that right now. But because we use local physicians in the CRS program, we're hoping that they will be able to utilize our program at CRS and then see the advantage of having this in their office. We're planning care coordination curriculum training for the summer of 2019, not just for children's rehabilitation service workers, but for any worker in the state or in the community who, provi who provides care coordination services. And these are some of the training objectives. I won't go over that, those because there's not enough time. Uh, we are also participating in the Children with Medical Complexity coin, which is a part of the nationwide multidisciplinary initiative to advance care for children with medical complexity. You'll see the overall aims of the, uh, of the project here. And on this screen, you'll see some of the things that we're really proud of that were established uh, when that, that we, uh, some activities that we completed when we established our coin uh, for CMC. Uh, we've developed our project aim statement. We've solidified a definition, which was very important for children with medical complexity. And um, we've started to do some QI and QA. And we've conducted surveys on shared plans of care. We've identified a pediatric practice at the University of South Alabama to provide a cohort for uh, CMC as well as care coordination services. And we're going to be looking for a clinic in North Alabama to do the same. And we, we expect that we're going to be able to really move the needle uh, on population-based services by participating in this national coin. And on the next screen, you'll see more of the coin activities that are planned. So in summary, we believe in CRS that we, we can continue to provide uh, a good amount of direct clinic services as long as our funding from the state continues and as long as we have a relationship with Medicaid and we receive funding from Medicaid. So uh, we're able to maintain our the same level of staff and at the same time utilize some of those staff, particularly those at the state office level, to help us with many of the initiatives that you will see listed here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Melinda. Um, and thank you all uh, for listening and um, engaging in conversation in the chat box. So um, we just got a question in for Melinda. Um, and I want to ask it quickly while you're still on, Melinda. Um, okay. So the question is, did you develop the care coordination curriculum that you will be using? Uh, the care coordination curriculum that we will use will be, we're going to invite a national speaker. Uh, I did not say that, and we have someone in mind. I just cannot um, call the name right now because uh, we have not confirmed that. So we will be using someone who has done work in that particular area. And they will be working with, we have a care coordination specialist on staff, too, who's a trained social worker. And she will be working with that individual so that they will know exactly what our program looks like and what the, what the people uh, who will be attending from the community will need um, in, their, in their practice. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So we have about five minutes before we um, close out with our activity um, for folks to ask other questions of the speakers. Um, we've had a few questions already answered in the chat box. Um, so just in the interest of time, I'm not going to read this out again. Um, but we'll be sure to send um, just a, a document um, recapping the questions and answers that have already been addressed. Um, so at this time, um, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself by pressing star 6 or by typing your questions into the chat box, and we'll be sure to answer as many as we can in the five minutes.
I can't imagine there are no questions after all of that great information was shared. Anyone have any burning thoughts they'd like to share with the group? Well, um, since we haven't had any questions come into the chat box, which is okay, maybe you guys are all just um, ruminating on what was shared, I will um, actually go ahead and turn it over to um, Steve Orton from the Workforce Development Center, um, and Steve is going to lead us in an activity. So, Steve? Steve, you oh, might okay. be on mute. Sorry, I, now I'm on. Now I'm off. All right, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear Whew. you. So many mute buttons. <laughs> I forgot the star <laughs> six one also. The activity is in your documents tab. So on the right hand side of your screen, underneath the notes, there's a set of documents, including the the wonderful slides. Um, and the activity is called Moving Down the Pyramid. I'm not sure why there's two versions of it. But if you click, uh, highlight that and click Download Files, you will get the activity. And if you're on the phone and you can't get the activity, what you need is a blank sheet of paper and a pen. And you need to draw a triangle on your paper. And you need to imagine that you're doing the presentation that Susan and Lonnie and Melinda just did, but you're doing it for your state. And the question for you is, on this tool, to think about what, what are we doing? What's in our portfolio that's at the top of the pyramid? What's in our work portfolio that's in the middle of the pyramid? And what's in our work portfolio that's at the base, the healthy, robust base of the pyramid? Um, so I was taking some notes uh, as the presenters were presenting. And it, if you were to go back through this recording with a blank sheet of paper or the triangle on it, you could actually chart the portfolio in Michigan and you could chart the portfolio in New Mexico. Um, I'm not sure you could. I'm not sure I could do Alabama, but I was I was trying to keep up with my um, Michigan and New Mexico. I think with Alabama, you could you could probably chart the portfolios for a couple of discrete programs, which might which might be a good alternative if you're somebody who works more at the program level. But for those. For the Michigan and the New Mexico, you could actually chart their portfolio based on the information that's in these slides. So, um, and then I asked Lonnie some follow-up questions, and they're in the chat about sort of putting putting dollars to those figures. So, from Lonnie's talk, you know that they do fund direct service. The theory might have been that that over time, their their dollars would go down in that part of the pyramid because ACA would come and people would migrate to other forms of um, coverage. But that did not happen. What happened instead is they uncovered more and more and more kids who needed service. <laughs> so so Lonnie's, 
uh, Lonnie's dollar figure didn't go down at all. He has the same number of people he had before. So that's how that change is happening over time. He's also got a whole lot of things happening in the middle section of the pyramid that have to do with, so there's, I was thinking of this in terms of um, you might draw a bubble on your um, on your pyramid that shows the different areas of work. So Lonnie's would have enrollment assistance, um, negotiation help, some planning, some coordination. Then at the bottom of of Lonnie's pyramid would be all of the more public health population uh, elements of the work. So it has to do with working with partners, oh. quality improvement, compliance, oh, assessment, policy, lots and lots of training similar to Alabama. And then family work, which is a big bubble and probably crosses over the middle and the bottom. So what you're looking at here on the screen is the picture of the tool. So you can use that for the definitions. And you can start to think about, well, here's the work that we're doing at these different levels. And then we've given you a blank sheet. So what I'm imagining is that you'll draw a triangle, something like that. And to start with, I mean, you, you, this is sort of a potentially a conversation starter between you and other people in your agency to think about where are we now and maybe where do we want to be. But even just right now on the phone, you could think, just uh, drawing a circle, I can say, OK, we're going to have a, there's our direct service spend. And that's kind of big. And then we've got a lot of work down here in the middle if, we're, if you're Lonnie. And I think others, too. Um, Susan said had similar things on her list that have to do with, there's our coordination work. There's maybe telehealth. Maybe the circle represents the amount of money you're spending, the amount of effort you're putting into it. Maybe it's the, you could try to guess what sort of impact you're having with that work. Um, partners, partner outreach is a bubble. And then there's a bunch of stuff that Lonnie mentioned down here that has to do with policy, assessment, training. A lot of folks are doing training down in this level. QI. This is direct service. So my challenge to you is do one of these for yourself right now at your desk or with a friend who's in your office listening with you. And then in the chat box in the short amount of time we have left, drop us a little note about how that went. What do you see when you look at your map? Does that work for you? Can you, can you do a map like that? What could it help you figure out? So the next generation would be to think, that's my 2018 pyramid. Where's my 2023 pyramid? What's that one going to look like? I have some friends on the phone I happen to know, or on the webinar, from Florida. I was down there last week. They're in the middle of um, trucking a lot of blocks from the top of the pyramid down to the bottom of the pyramid. So um, I know that they're sketching away on their map, and I'd be interested to hear their um, reflections on where they are now and where they think they're going to be in the next three years. So. Deidre, I see your name on here. 
Oh, and Stacy J goes on twice. So definitely I'm expecting a Stacy J go now. Lonnie, let me don't know how I did on your pyramid here. Looks beautiful. Just don't put my name on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> One of the things we talked about on the chat, Lonnie, was that the, you do a lot of work with families, and it kind of um, it kind of works at multiple levels. Paige and Rebecca, do you want to do you want me to say more about next steps, or I imagine you're going to say something about next steps? Uh, yeah, Steve, um, this is Paige. I can just mention that um, throughout the, the webinar series um, that we are doing, this collaboration lab series, we will have um, similar or activities that will build upon the activity that we're asking you all to either do today or do when you hop off the call or sometime in the next week or so. Um, as we don't want these webinars to just be uh, people talking at you, right? We want you all to be taking what you've learned from the webinar um, and thinking about how that can impact the work you're doing in your own state. Um, so we're hoping that this uh, what we're calling it, skills uh, development activity, will be helpful for you all to um, start to, you know, take take steps and, um, you know, move towards um, different types of collaboration strategies, um, as, as has been suggested by this series. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, webinar two, um, we are just finalizing the date right now. Um, it will be um, in the middle of December. Um, that webinar is really going to be focused on um, partnerships with local health departments, um, partnerships with family organizations, um, and community building. And then our final webinar, which will um, be in the new year, will focus mostly on um, the workforce perspective and all of this. Um, so today, today's webinar is really just, as we said, it's an example. The whole series is not about moving down the pyramid. We're using that as an example for today's webinar. Um, and we hope that the, by completing the activity and thinking about, um, you know, your own state in this, um, within this larger scheme of things, um, that that can help you uh, with your collaboration strategies. So Becky just pulled on the screen um, just the calendar of when we um, think about the webinar. So second webinar will take place. We're just finalizing one more speaker. Um, and we will send that to everyone who was in attendance today via email. Um, so thank you, Steve, so much for um, facilitating that and uh, using Lonnie in Michigan as a great example. Um, I did want to just make sure that we had a chance to thank um, all of our wonderful speakers as well as our participants for being on the call today. Um, we do hope that all of you found this to be value added for your work and that you'll share the information with your colleagues. Um, the webinar was recorded and we will be sharing that link to the recording and the speaker slides. Um, those will be shared to the AMCHIP website as well as in a post-webinar email via direct link. 
Um, Becky will be sharing a uh, brief evaluation for you all to um, hopefully fill out on your screen shortly. It'll pop up. Um, you'll also receive a link after the webinar. Um, so thank you all very much again. If you have any questions, um, you can find all the contact information for all of our speakers on the, um, the agenda and in their bios from today. Um, so feel free to just reach out to them if you have All right, everyone. Thank you for this meeting, and have a lovely rest of your day.